and welcome to South to North. I'm Ridi Tlavi. And this week we step outside the studio to take you on a journey to West Africa. We meet one of Africa's newest presidents, Senegal's Macky Sall. He started his working life as a geologist, but turned to politics pretty soon and was elected in April 2012 as the fourth president of his country since it achieved independence from France in 1960. While the economy is still struggling and literacy rates are low, Senegal is seen as a beacon of democracy in West Africa and is the only country in the region never to have had a military coup. President Macky Sall is just 51 years old, and he told me he represents the youth of Senegal, who make up two-thirds of the country's population. I think my history is a new history of the young generation in Africa. Uh, president Ward was an old uh, president, but very dynamic uh, in politics. So uh, my people, people of Senegal, need change. And last election in last April 2012, they decided to, to elect a new president uh, who is a good representative of the youth of Senegal. We are a very young country. Well, you're saying that your predecessor, Abdullah Awad, was a dynamic man, but he did try to amend the constitution right. to allow him a third term. You were fiercely opposed to that. Why? For democracy, because I think uh, he lost his way trying to impose a new candidacy because our constitution was very, very clear. And I think the time where a man can have more than two terms is over. Mm -hmm. This time is over because we, we are uh, living in a, in a new age of democracy in Africa. That's why I think uh, people of Senegal just uh, remind him that this time is over, and uh, it was uh, the last time where Senegal can uh, have a, a president with third or, or four terms. And my signal was when I was elected for seven years to cut it to you five. Reduce the president to reduce to it, five years, right? Just to give example, and uh, yeah, to say the time now is just to make two terms. Or five years. But Mr. President, it seems that African leaders like yourself, who are young, who embrace democracy, you don't want to be bold enough to speak out when your counterparts on the African continent are violating those democratic uh, principles. We talk about a new age, a new era. Yeah, Isn't no, this the time to speak out? It is out? clear. What we are talking uh, loudly. We, we, we believe in democracy, but we, we are not the, the one who is giving lesson to others, you know. This is a Muslim country, yet Absolutely. it is home to the likes of Yusun Do right. and uh, uh, also Ismail Lo, and they are famous for their richly expressive dance and music. How do you reconcile, how do these two worlds reconcile, the Muslim part and the rich music? Uh, Senegal is a very special country where you can have in the same family Muslim people, one part is Muslim, the other is Christian, or Africans, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the, the people who believe in spirit, African spirit. Because before having Muslim, Islam in Africa and Christianism, we used to be African with our African beliefs. So we have a very good interaction between those religion. And we, we, we live uh, with this uh, different culture, different religions, mm -hmm. uh, peacefully. Even we have a one cemetery here where we, we keep Muslims and Christians in the same cemetery. This is very Senegalese, very special. And you can have also in the same family, the husband can be Muslim or Christian, the wife, uh, the other religion. Uh, this is our uh, particular here in Senegal. That's why we are the nation of Teranga, which is hospitality. And we are very, very um, patient to have Everybody living with his own value, with his own culture. You are actually a geologist. Now, I've, I've heard of presidents who have a, a, a union background, a legal background, a military background. How does a geologist become a president? It's uh, hazardous. I don't know why, because uh, as a geologist, uh, I think my way is the field, uh, trying to get oil or water on the underground. Uh, not to be in the palace here and to leave <laughs> my country, but you know, in the life you never know. 
uh, I, I, I came in politics just to, to struggle, uh, what we, we, I call in French injustice social. I mean, I don't like uh, injustice, uh, the, the, the bad thing, like uh, when the unions don't have what they supposed to have, mm -hmm. when you have on the same society inequality and you have someone who are over uh, the inequality, inequality. The, the gap I, I, the against, I, I struggle against inequality. That's why I came very early in the, in the university as a university union, and I struggled to have better condition to, to live, and we struggle against the social party who was here and who led Senegal for 40 years, and we, we try to, to be on the side of the people and to try to, to bring justice, freedom, that's why I was involved in politics. So the geologist in you is also a romantic. I read somewhere Absolutely. that you said to your wife that you didn't find oil, but I found but you said I didn't find any oil, but I found my you. Wife. Are you romantic? Absolutely, Mr. absolutely. I, and I, I, you only have one wife. I come from a country, South Africa, no, where no. our president has four wives, four and there may be more. He's there are four wives guy. and fiancés. He's a strong. I, guy. Yeah, he is very strong. I, are you I that like, strong? Uh, I like uh, what he, if I can, I will, but I cannot do. Do so. I have only one wife. <laughs> and in literacy, I used to read with a Nigerian literacy, not another wife, when we was in college. It was a very amusing uh, story where uh, one guy in Nigeria has a second wife because polygamy is very popular in Africa. But he has so big trouble. He said, not another wife. But sometimes it can be very amusing also. I think. Sometimes people can develop polygamy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a good value, you know, today. People you think are it is good, Mr. About, President? Uh, Why? People are talking about uh, uh, what, what we call marriage is uh, when, the, uh, when a man married a woman. Today, men and men can be married, a woman and woman can be married. Are you Why? happy with that? No, I'm, 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 I'm not <laughs> considering that. It's not my, my value. I, I, res I can respect people who do that, but it's not my choice. So uh, I think in that way, people have to accept polygamy. As because a value. we accept other of types course. of marriages. Of course, absolutely. Let's talk about uh, Islam again. Is your government hostile towards more religious Islam? You recently clamped down on protesters after the arrest of Sheikh Turin. People were hurt. And what I want to know is, is there a fault line between the more and less religious uh, groupings in Senegal? Senegal has a very moderate Islam. Fortunately, we have uh, local leaders who uh, are the, the big leaders in the religion. We are not, uh, uh, we, are, we don't have any reference to Salafism or to Wahhabism or, you know, those kind of fundamentalism. Because you can't ignore the rise of radical Islam. I mean, the Arab Spring, are you concerned about the rise of a more radical form of Islam? Uh, what happened in the Arab, uh, Arabic uh, Spring is not uh, Islamic. It's not a problem of Islamic. Of course, it is politics, but the Islam, the fundamentalism, have a good organization. When the state is broken and is down, of course, the, the more organized take the power. Mm -hmm. It's what happened in, uh, in different country, Arabic country. It is not better than democracy, I think. So uh, today we have to keep our model of democracy, uh, the rule of law, democracy, uh, mixity, and also everybody can live with his own value, his own religion, and his own culture. But you must it's, be concerned. You mentioned Mali. You must be concerned with what happened in absolutely. what's happening in Mali. The African Union is even talking about military intervention. Right. Is that the solution? And if it is, are you not worried about retaliatory attacks that will spill over to Senegal? Yeah, it is absolutely possible. But you know, when you have something to again to to struggle against, you have to do it. Uh, we can discuss with people who can who accept to discuss with democracy with uh, living together in peace, but people who have to impose their own opinion, who think that they have to make application of fundamentalism, we cannot follow those people. And if we don't do nothing, I think our people will, 
will be in trouble, like what happened today in the North Mali in Tombouctou. That's why we have to put peace in Africa, to struggle against uh, uh, what we call bad governance, to improve democracy and high institution. And in that way, Africa have youth intelligence, and it should be the next continent who will lead the development. Is that what you meant when you spoke, when you said of the UN recently that we need uh, a new world order? What Absolutely. Do you mean we we yeah. need a new world order because we are, we are young. We don't, my generation don't know colonialism. That means uh, we are talking with uh, European or American as... Uh, as you know, equals? Absolutely equals, absolutely. We are small countries, okay, but we are, we are absolutely equal. And partnership, mm -hmm. we, we have to deal together and to work uh, as, a, as a partner. You have big countries, you have small countries. Some countries have billions of people, other countries have uh, maybe some hundred thousand. But they are just countries, so they have to work together with respect and uh, friendly, friendship. With, with the uh, re-election of Barack Obama, who's also a young president, do you yep. see that happening? Because the United States has been known as a country that uses its military and economic might to enforce its own authority to the detriment of smaller nations. Are we equal players? I think uh, the re-election of Barack Obama was something very important for, for America first, and also for the rest of the world, because uh, he's a good leader, it is my opinion, not because he was re-elected. Uh, he's young and he's open mind, and I think uh, with his second term, maybe he will have more uh, opportunity to, to give a, a new way of development. Uh, and I think also with his second term with Africa, he will give a, a new uh, push of the cooperation between Africa and the United States. Mr. President, that brings us to the end of our conversation. Thank you very much for giving us your time here on Al Jazeera, and I look forward to exploring this beautiful country of yours even further. Thank you. Welcome again in Senegal, and uh, bienvenue au Senegal, et bon séjour. Merci. Très bien. <laughs> So while I was in Senegal, I also attended a special governance forum in Dakar and met up with a father and daughter team working together to ensure that Africa is a continent taken seriously on the world stage. The Mo Ibrahim Award for Excellence in African Leadership was started in 2007 and is the world's biggest individual prize. It's given to former heads of state and starts with $5 million upfront and then $200,000 each year of their life. It's a project by Sudanese-born cell phone billionaire Mo Ibrahim and his daughter Hadil. Take a look. Hadil, in Johannesburg recently, you proudly described your father as a troublemaker. Why? I think that, um, I think that his work, both in the private sector and now, um, what we do together with the foundation is disruptive, willfully disruptive. You know, it's risk taking, it's going against the status quo, be it mobile phones at a time when people thought that wasn't really feasible or appropriate for Africa. And now similarly with the foundation, you know, I think he, I think he consistently sets out to make change and to do that you have to make some noise and some trouble. You also said that no one works harder than your dad. His mind is constantly working. Are you in his shadow? I mean, you seem to admire him a lot and I can identify with that as a daddy's girl myself. Yeah. But are you in his shadow? I don't think so. I mean, I, I hope not. I don't know. I mean, I think you make a decision as the child of someone quite prominent. Um, how you're going to manage that. And I think some people deliberately seek to work in very different fields to their parents so that they can really forge a completely separate identity and that's how they kind of attain some sort of sense of self. Whereas I think we have a very strong relationship. So, um, and we argue, you know, and he listens. In fact, that's what I want argue. to know. Mo, do you take advice from, from Hadil? I mean, she is the executive director of the foundation does she sometimes tell you, no, this is not what we're going to do? Yeah, I think this is the most interesting and false statement I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> this young lady manages me. <laughs> Absolutely manages me. It's not a question of me taking advice. I take orders and instructions from her. Okay, let's talk about your position now. Uh, you were named uh, as the most influential black person 
in Britain. Do you consider yourself British? I mean, what's in Mo Ibrahim's heart? Are you British? Are you African? Or you have that conflict of immigrants? Yeah, the first part, actually, I, I, I'm really surprised when you say most influential black. black. I mean, still, when I go through Heathrow, they pick up my passport. I have a British passport. And they look at me and look at the passport. <laughs> Who are and you? they tap a few things. Oh, my name is Mohammed. Oh, I must check again. You know, oh, Ibrahim. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Sudan. That is very dangerous. Oh. So they, after three or four taps in their computers, they let me in. Then you're British enough have, after have, a few have, times. have endured the curiosity. I think, really, Eddie, now we live in, uh, in a global world, really. We all have multiple identity. Mm. When I say I'm African, what does it mean to be an African? OK, I'm, I'm a Nubian. Nubians is one of the oldest civilization on the Nile. Uh, okay. So that part of my identity. I was born a Muslim. That's part of our... Uh, of my identity. I live in Britain, my adopted country, and I have a British passport. So that's also part of my identity. I'm involved also in life in, in, in Britain. I support Arsenal. That's also part of my identity. So do I. So I, we've got something in common. Great. <laughs> so we live in this world of multiple identities. Let's talk about the Mo Ibrahim Prize. What's the idea behind it? I mean, why give former heads of state money? In my mind, the people who need the money are the poor. You have a head of state who's already taken care of. So why the prize, Mo? There's a number of reasons to start with. When you talk about African leaders out there, the perception in Europe, in Asia, in America, that African leaders are not really that good. We have a very bad image. You have to understand that the, you work in the media. All what you guys talk about all the time are either Mugabe or Mobutu or Idi Amin. So all those people, all those European and, and American, Spanda, they know all those me. people, OK? But they don't know our people. They don't know that we have some really good, decent leaders. Whenever I speak in Africa, and sorry, in Europe or in the States, I ask the audience, do, do you know Shisano? Mm. Do, you know, do you know Mukhai? Who, what is that? Festus Mokhai. No, we don't know Festus Mokhai. Why? Why Why don't know? The, so we need to bring forward the brand of Africa. We need to brand Africa by successful leaders, not by failed leaders. But That's very important. But is your prize a form of philanthropy? I mean, or are you just cozying up to no, the powers? Yeah, is? let me finish, please. That's one point. Second point, this is very important. Uh, uh, subtle something here. Where good people go after office? Do they have life after office? Okay. Look at President, President Clinton. After office, he started CIG, the Clinton Global Initiative, and uh, CGI, sorry. And uh, it's amazing work. But Mo, I have to come in here. I, yeah. I, I, I hear the whole idea around the prize and that we still need to use the presidents because they have all the expertise that could benefit the continent. But should it be up to you to reward them? Doesn't that reflect the fact that you have to do, do it and your foundation? Doesn't that reflect a problem then in our countries? Probably. And you're Probably. trying to solve it? Yes. Civil society is partner to govern this part of what's happening. We need to see where deficiencies are. Let's talk about what you once told me a couple of uh, years ago when we were speaking in South Africa. And you said, you've, you've never paid a bribe. You've yeah. made it, and you don't do business in any country where you've, you ask for a bribe. That's hard to believe. Have you never paid a bribe, or have you never been asked for a bribe? No, we never paid. We never paid. And actually, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. You have to remember something about this chemistry of bribery. Uh, you have two parties here. You have a crooked politician and a crooked businessman or businesswoman. Usually it's businessman. And uh, actually, for every crooked or bent politician, there is maybe 20 or 30 crooked business people. In our board, we, we said, the way to protect our chief executives in the countries where we may have a problem is to make a rule. Nobody in the company, not even me, I was the chief executive and the chairman of the board, I cannot sign a check more than $30,000. Mm -hmm. So you limit the amount that they... No cash. 
the board has to approve, the board have to sign the check. Of course, that is a business challenge in a fast growing company. But what we had was the full support of the board because that enabled us to run our business successfully at the same time holding the line. So Hadil, what is it for you? Is, it, is this just a job or you see some values uh, that your father has taught you and you're trying to take those forward and espouse that? Absolutely, I mean, I think we, I grew up in a very political environment, you know, my parents were constantly, and their friends were always arguing about issues and values. So that's always been a part of my life. So I couldn't ever conceive of working in a field that wasn't somehow connected to public good in one way and to promoting change. So um, I don't think we ever expected to work together necessarily. I think there was always, I always wanted to do something in Africa. And, in activism or, you know, I didn't know, would I be an aid worker? You know, where would I sort of fit in in this whole development story? And it just, you know, I think it was chance as much as anything that, and timing. You are the founding executive director of the foundation. So was it your idea for Daddy to give his money away? Did you tell him we will give money away? No, not at all. Um, you know, the prize was the one thing that was kind of fully conceived of before I got involved. I think he had always wanted, he'd had this idea for the prize while working in the private sector. Um, and so it was really about what kind of institution do you create that can deliver that credibly? So how would you structure, I mean, as a governance organization, how do you govern the organization internally? Um, and then in terms, once you're thinking about how you decide on a winner, we realized there was this complete lack of data so the index actually was first conceived of as a way to help implement the prize. Um, I, interestingly enough, I think now, seven or so years later, we would all say that the index is much more important than the prize, and that's our main contribution. I do I get a sense that there, there has to be a meeting between the old and the new. I mean, you have spoken about that moment in Tunisia where that young man set himself uh, on fire and that it sent shockwaves, of course, but nobody could envisage at that time that it would have such serious ramifications for the entire region. As a young person, what does the Arab Spring mean to you and what does it teach us? You know, I, I found there's so much that was exciting about the Arab Spring for me because it, it was a moment that showed young people that they can do anything. Now, Subsequently, we may be concerned about the direction of some of the countries are heading in, but that initial moment of agency on a continent where 50% of our population is under 19.8 years, mm -hmm. I think the, the notion that they will all grow up into a society where they know that they have the power to overthrow even the, the sort of most powerful dictators or the most entrenched... That civil or, society... You, know, you can do that with mobile phones, you can get out in the street. I'm not saying that that should happen in every country, but I think it gives young people a sense of their own power. And too often, young people feel powerless. Mm. Um, particularly when you look at high youth unemployment rates. You know, we have a lot of unemployed young people sitting around doing very much. Mm -hmm. um, now, Bono, whom I also respect, and I know you've worked closely with him, has described you as frighteningly smart. I like that, <laughs> frighteningly smart. What does that mean? I mean, do you have uh, a special person, a, a partner somewhere, who doesn't find you frighteningly smart? I don't think I'm frightening. Um, no. No, leave that to us. <laughs> leave that to us. Bono thinks you frighten me smart. And if you frighten Bono, then you are frightening. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think I think it's exciting to be a young woman at this moment in the world and especially to be a young black woman. There's no other time in the history of the world that I could be doing what I'm doing and I can be sitting in rooms talking to older men from other cultural backgrounds and they have to listen. They have to listen. Well, they have to listen. You know, this is the world we live in now. Well, I'm delighted. I'm glad to have spoken to both of Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm particularly happy that, uh, Hadil, you were part of the conversation because if you were not, you'd be standing here giving your father instructions to now get up and wrap up the interview. So I'll do it for you. Let's wrap it up. Thank, Thank you, Mo and Hadil. Thank, Thank you very much, Ray. Thank, Thank you. you. And that's it for this week on South to North here in Johannesburg. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye and see you next time.